So welcome and thank you for joining this session on financing system change at the UNOG World Academy of Art and Science Conference on Strategies for Social Transformation, Global Social Transformation. This session is a particularly important session for us, for we who are organizing this conference, and I believe for the answers that we want to come up with in this project, Global Leadership in the 21st Century. And it has something to do with the nature of money. Uh, for a long time, we have left the subject of money to purely to the economists, thinking that it's a specialized instrument for a specialized purpose. But the more we look at it, we realize that money's connected to absolutely everything in society. And the best analogy I can give to it is uh, language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Language is a networking tool. Without it, we would not have civilization. We would not have communication. We would not have collective existence and cooperation and all that we've created. And as language makes it possible for communication in all types of human relations, hi, Dragon. Thank you for joining me. Hey, Dragon. Language makes that possible. Uh, money makes possible interactions between human beings, which would be extremely difficult and cumbersome and limited very much in space and time uh, if we did not have this instrument of money. And one of the characteristics of money as a networking tool is it's really a symbol of much more than the goods and services which we are typically thinking about when we utilize it. It's a form of social power. And by power, I mean the capacity to get things done in society. Whether we want education or we want healthcare or we want to communicate or we want to move about or uh, virtually anything we want to do, uh, money facilitates it. And it interacts with all the dimensions of social existence. And we know it's not just interacting in the economy, but it's interacting with everything else in the society as, all, as well, as we see with the political system. Even in what we call a democracy, money plays an inordinately important role in determining who gets elected uh, and what types of policies are followed as we go along uh, in governments that are elected, as well as in influencing the quality of education available to us the information available to us and so many other things. So my point in making this as an introductory remark uh, has great bearing on our topic of global leadership because money is connected to all the dimensions of society. And what we decide about money and how we use it and how our financial system acts influences virtually how the whole society acts. And with the same, uh, in the same way, we now live much more than we did 30 years ago in a globalized society. And up until that time, money was restricted very much by national boundaries, by national uh, banking systems. And now we really have money overflowing and becoming a global social system, which is not as strictly bound by any of the laws that it was or rules uh, when, it was, uh, when it was strictly confined to the national level. It adds a new dimension. And a third new dimension has come, and I'm sure some of you may refer to it, is when we have seen to a large extent, a shift in the nature of the economy to what we call a financialization of the economy, where uh, the economy is much more characterized by money flows and they have a much greater influence on it than they did in prior decades. So for all these reasons, uh, money really virtually touches everything. Now this conference, I don't mean just the session, but the conference, the project on global leadership is a project on how do we address global social challenges in the 21st century? And that includes all the challenges. And when we try to do that, we find 
that this piecemeal segmentation and say, well, pandemic is a health problem or, or unemployment is an economic problem or democracy is a political problem, we find that these uh, facile generalizations don't work anymore, that everything's connected with everything else. And therefore, the title of our session financing system change is to recognize not just that we need money to do certain things, but the way the system works and the relationship between the whole social system and money is of, in, is of great importance. And we can't just look at the small fine print of how we do particular, where we get money for a particular transaction. We have to understand the system as a whole. And I know that uh, uh, Frank will uh, expand on this in his opening comments. So I just wanted to set the context. This is not really a session on finance. This is a session on the role of finance in global society and its relationship to human well-being, welfare and well-being in every part of it. And we have to ask ourselves a couple of questions as we go along. Uh, one is, that uh, we have a financial system and what's the purpose of that system? And I hope you will give some thought and comment on it as we go through. I mean, I think there was a time historically when we regarded the financial system as an adjunct and an essential support for the real economy. Uh, but sometimes it looks like it's the reverse now, that the real economy is the tail and the financial system is running itself and the economic system tries to try to catch up with it. And I think these are questions we need to think about as we go through. What is the purpose of the financial system in the overall objectives of society? And is it, and how effectively is it playing that role? Uh, we have another issue today. I'm just trying to put up some things to think about as you go through with the questions uh, that Economics was founded as the dismal science because it was the silent science of scarcity. But in many respects today, uh, we don't live in a, a society of scarcity. We live in a society of superabundance. The only thing is that superabundance is not very well evenly distributed. We have in some areas a huge excess of capacity that's not being utilized and in other areas unmet social needs. We have this paradox. And so when we talk about the efficiency of our system, of our whole social system, not just our economic or our financial system, we have to ask ourselves how efficient really is the social system that we have today. If we have now hundreds of millions and more being added every day of human beings who don't have access to remunerative employment, which means their human capacity is not being utilized very efficiently, and certainly their needs are not being made, met very efficiently. Whereas in other areas, we have, a, we have excess of money. I think the figures are something like 300 trillion in global financial assets now, roaming the world searching for the best return they can get. Uh, whereas real investment in the real economy to create real jobs and re, re, real needs is often lacking. So these are the, some of the things that we'd like you to keep in mind as you're going through. And the specific context, of course, is we've got the SDGs, 17 SDGs, and the estimates are, I hope uh, Stefan and others will talk to it, are we need about $7 trillion a year in investment to really meet these SDGs at the global level. And the question is, is that possible? And is there some way in which the financial system, if it's not happening today, that it has to do not with the impossibility or unavailability of the money, but the way in which our system is working. And we want to explore those limitations and those possibilities and say, could it be working differently and better? And of course, we've got some really serious challenges of which COVID is the most uh, 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 intent, intense and ever present right now. But we know there's the big one 
uh, just sitting right behind it, waiting for the air to clear so we can go back to talking about what the real serious problems are of climate change and rising inequality and the retreat from democracy uh, and uh, the polarization of society. And all of these things somehow intimately connected with finance and the way we're running our global financial system. So with those introductions, I'd like to thank you, welcome you for the panel and turn it over to Frank for his comments and then to introduce you and get started on our discussion, Frank. Thank you, Gary. I'd like to echo your um, welcome to all the panelists and the participants. It's an honor for me to be participating in this distinguished panel. I'll make a few framing comments and then I'll turn it over to our panelists and ask them some questions about financing system change and the SDGs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Financing system change is, is critical for achieving the SDGs. Uh, Gary mentioned seven trillion. I saw a more recent estimate from the UN saying that we need $12 trillion uh, to achieve the SDGs and uh, several of, of our panelists will have good ideas about how to provide those funds. So I look forward to hearing them. Uh, the SDG, in terms of system change, the SDGs are focused on addressing specific environmental, social and economic problems. The main root cause of these problems are flawed economic and political systems these systems unintentionally put business in conflict with society and humanity in conflict with nature. They compel companies to cause, uh, cause problems that create the need for the SDGs. So improving our systems is the most important action needed to achieve the SDGs. This means that we need two broad types of investments to achieve them. One, direct investments in resolving problems, which could be called SDG investments and another type of investment in addressing root causes, which could be called system change investments. To effectively invest in system change, we have to understand what system change is and how it occurs. Throughout human history, uh, all flawed uh, systems have changed, usually by collapsing. Change often occurs when the flaws of systems become obvious and they create overwhelming pain. Uh, the murder of George Floyd, for example, uh, made a systemic black injustice in the US uh, clear. Um, it ignited the long-term suffering of African-Americans and it will drive system change. The risk of COVID also was obvious, it was killing people. So it drove rapid uh, widespread change. There are other larger risks as Gary mentioned that are not so obvious like climate change or an H5N1 influenza pandemic, which could kill half of humanity. The danger of these risks is that by the time they become obvious to many people, it's often too late to avoid great disruption, probably a lot worse than what we're facing right now with COVID. An example of a large uh, but not obvious injustice is fractional reserve lending. Gary mentioned the monetary system. Yesterday on the excellent employment panel, uh, Randall uh, uh, was discussing the unlimited ability of, of government to produce funds to, for socially beneficial purposes. The key issue is who creates those funds. For all of US history, we've allowed the private sector to create nearly all the money supply through fractional reserve lending. This nearly doubles individual income taxes and raises the national debt. If citizens reclaim their right to create the money supply, it would greatly reduce taxes, the national debt, deficit spending, and provide all the funding needed to uh, stimulate the economy, um, rebuild our infrastructure and implement a strong social safety net. If the people understood the injustice of fractional reserve lending the way they now understood systemic black injustice, they, they wouldn't tolerate it. An increasingly clear injustice that Gary also mentioned has to do with the structure of the global capital markets. Um, well over $150 trillion uh, in financial assets are out there. Only 20% of them go into the real economy. Most of them are used for speculation, meaning money is used to make money instead of benefit society. The speculation drives inequality and other problems. As that becomes obvious and creates uh, pain, uh, the mainstream is paying attention. The World Economic Forum and other uh, groups are talking about um, reforming capitalism and other types of systemic change. So to achieve large-scale system change, the type we need to reverse environmental and social degradation, you have to use a whole system approach. 
since the 1970s, there have been many focused economic and political reform efforts like developing better measures of social well-being than GDP. These have provided benefits, but not produced the scale of systemic change that we need. Um, a whole system approach is based on recognizing the interconnectedness of all of society and taking all relevant factors into account. Probably the best framework for that is the laws and operating principles of nature. Our ability to modify nature creates the illusion sometimes that we're in charge, but the real boss is out the window behind me right there. For 3.5 billion years, nature's been chugging along and all species, including humans, have, a, have been required to abide by certain principles. That's gonna be the case going forward. Uh, and whether or not we abide by these will determine whether or not we survive and prosper. So these principles include the common ones we often hear about the circular economy of producing no waste, but other characteristics of sustainable systems include equitable resource distribution, cooperation, and decentralized governance and production. These aren't ethical issues. They are actual requirements for sustainable systems. When they're not present, the systems die or change. So um, the SDGs are a great milestone in humanity. They provide a human-centric view of sustainability, but the reality-based view is nature-centric. Abiding by nature's laws is the best way to achieve the goals. For example, abiding by the principle of equitable resource distribution will achieve uh, most of the SDGs. So understanding the qualities of, of a sustainable society shows systemic changes needed to get there and the actions needed to bring them about. That in total provides a roadmap for system change for humanity that, that we can use to guide investment in other efforts. Uh, another, way, another important framing device for system change for economic and political reform is the rule of law, which says do whatever you want, but don't hurt anyone. Nearly all the economic and political systems laws violate the rule of law by not holding companies fully responsible for negative impacts. This is the overarching meta flaw. Yesterday, Hank and Gary discussed limited liability. There are many types of system flaws that don't hold companies responsible. Limited liability is one of them. By failing to hold investors and companies fully responsible, it often compels them to cause negative environmental and social impacts. If, if they tried to fully stop, they'd go out of business. Other examples of system flaws that fail to hold companies responsible include externalities, time value of money, uh, focusing on economic growth instead of social well-being, and allowing regulated entities to inappropriately influence regulators. Um, so the, if the meta problem is the failure to hold companies responsible, the meta solution is to hold them, meta system change solution is to hold companies responsible. One of the reasons that a lot of money flows into speculative investments is because investors and companies aren't held responsible for the negative impacts that those investments cause. If they were, then the most beneficial uh, investments would also become the, the most profitable. And that's probably the most important way to shift the funds from speculation into investments that benefit humanity. So a key, a key question is how do we engage the financial sector in system change, especially how do they use their core business of investing to do it? There are many types of system change investments, but probably the best and largest opportunity is to use the existing sustainable responsible investing structure. The SRI markets over 30 trillion and is growing faster than traditional investments. For over 20 years, it's successfully compelled companies to implement sustainability strategies. We can use the exact same approach to engage the corporate, corporate and financial sectors in system change. I'll discuss this more in a panel on Thursday at two o'clock, but basically the approach involves shift, expanding the focus of ESG research to include corporate system change performance. That way um, uh, we engage the corporate and financial sectors. When you develop funds on that, we engage the companies and investors in driving system change. It's a relatively easy approach uh, compared to other system change so, options. Questions so we can. Yes, I would. Economic and political reform is, is, uh, is difficult, but this doesn't do that and just incentivizes companies and investors to drive system change. So it's important to have a, a clear communication strategy 
to engage those sectors, but we also need to understand what system change is. That's the first priority. That enables clear communication. So let me just wrap up with one final point and get to the questions. And that is that system change is inevitable. Our flawed economic and political systems inevitably will change through voluntary or involuntary means. COVID, the Floyd protests, and many other um, things going on today show that our systems are in the process of changing. We can't stop system change, but we can guide it. And we've got some great panelists now who can, who are already uh, advocating or implementing uh, ways of innovative approaches to uh, driving system change and achieving the SDGs. So um, I think a good way to go, we've got a distinguished group of panelists here. Um, rather than introducing all of you, why don't I pose the first question and allow you to self-select uh, on it. And the, the first question I would present is, how can the financial system better support the real economy enhance human well-being and help to resolve environmental and social challenges? Which of our distinguished panelists? Keitan. So, uh, Frank, thank you very much. And thank you, Gary, for convening the panel. I think this is probably one of the most profound questions uh, for, for us to actually consider together. Uh, I'd frame it this way also and, and then get it straight into the question. Um, we're in a transition of civilizations. So we had an industrial civilization for, for many hundreds of years, and we're transitioning to a more digital information civilization. In that process, the financial system, which was built for the industrial ages, is creaking and struggling to keep up with the level of change that we will need in the next phase. And I think that's the core of the challenge that we face. The, the participants uh, that we should consider in the question you posed are three. They're, they are the business, they're the finance or the financiers, uh, the market participants in the financial community, and they're the consumer. If you look at the numbers, what you find is there is the governments of the world underlying all of this and the financial assets, the financial wealth that is available to invest in the system itself is, is estimated last year to be about $350 trillion, of which approximately 70% is originally in the hands of households to deploy into the financial system. So probably the most powerful constituent in the financial system, the remainder is mostly the government. So the most powerful constituent is probably the consumer. It's, it's our belief as we look at the financial system to think it's somebody else, but the consumer choices about what to buy and what not to buy probably change the whole system. So much of this conference over this week will consider how you increase the consciousness, the awareness, the choices, the level of participation of ordinary people every day, like ourselves and others, in the, in the system itself. If at the point of purchase they make a choice not to buy from a company they believe is corrupt or polluting or behaving in the wrong ways, they will profoundly change the system. And of course, there are many other layers of choices because that money, once it goes from the households, ends up in the financial system with other participants. And approximately 60% of that ends up uh, of all the financial assets in the hands of banks. But I, I would still go back to the recognition that in the next decade or two, the power of the consumer, the power of the individual will be profound and will change the whole system regardless of whether financial participants wake up and realize that or not they will have no choice because these are the powerful individuals that control where they place their money and how they make their choices. And I think so we're up for a big change in the world, which is already happening in politics and we will see it happen to businesses too and to financial participants. Thank you, Keitan. Mariana? Yes, I would like to bring an aspect into this conversation where now uh, we've been talking for 25 minutes um, that uh, was touched by Gary in the beginning um, in, in two aspects, but um, I would like for us to really deepen the conversation um, between the discrepancy 
of an economics uh, that we currently have that is actually inflation producing. Um, it's, um, it's an economy that uh, is based on a Ponzi scheme, basically. We're uh, lending money from the future and expect our children to be paying for it. On one hand, that's inflationary. And on the other hand, something that we're not looking at, just as much as we're not looking at the environment, um, that comes from the abundance created through exponential technology. And uh, that is deflationary. And uh, we have, nobody's looking into it because it, it's going to be extremely painful to reset the economy. And um, I think that con I don't have the answers. I just know that it is occurring. And uh, because we're dealing here with exponentially, actually double exponential forces. And most of us human beings are not in a position to understand exponentials. Um, and I keep, I would love to ask our uh, listeners, and I know they're very informed, they're high level um, academicians, um, ask your uh, family, your friends, what would they prefer? One penny doubled every day for 30 days or $30? And that will tell you that people do not get it. And our um, economists, our politicians, they don't understand it either. But this exponential growth is basically at the foundation of exponentially uh, growing technology. And this is happening whether we like the conversation or not. So while I, I know and I agree and I'm actually part of it that the consumer has the opportunity to influence what's happening, the consumer capital is actually losing in value as we speak every single day. And it's losing in value, particularly because of the printing of money, of the Ponzi scheme eco economy that we're living in, that is scarcity based. Mm -hmm. So we need to bring into this conversation, and it's a, actually the most important conversation of our time right now. How are we going to mitigate the inflationary economy with the deflation caused by exponential tech? and how that is actually influencing the jobs um, and the businesses and companies and so on. I have been an investor for almost 30, day, uh, 30 years, creating companies in the real economy. And uh, I kind of understand how to drive growth and be integrally sustainable. But the economy and the conversation, if we want to participate in this, I would love to bring this conversation to the forefront. Thank you. That's a key issue. How do we implement the sustainable economy? And I, I do agree we should address that on this panel. But let's do so. Hazel? Yes. You're muted, Hazel. You have to unmute yourself. Bottom left of the screen. Yes, there we are. Thanks. So I agree with absolutely everything that's been said so far. And I want to go a little bit further outside the box um, with my own experience um, of the last 40 years where I have been engaging uh, frontally, as it were, with the financial system and with the old economic textbooks and all the faulty assumptions therein. And uh, we have on our website a statement which has been signed now by about 100 financial professionals, which we uh, drafted here in 2010, so a decade ago, called Transforming Finance. And we went to the heart of the matter and brought in nature's principles and the fact that there is no analog in nature to money there are all kinds of flows of nitrogen and oxygen and uh, potassium and all of these other elements. Uh, but we have uh, contrasted nature's economy and how that functions with the artificial economy uh, that humans created out of these faulty textbooks. And so uh, one of, uh, I have been involved as an advisor developing screens for the Calvert Group for 20 years, which uh, basically developed uh, the SRI ESG kind of screens that uh, we have all been using. 
And the, of course, that uh, was all the no-nos. And we have, we're way past that now in terms of having to look at the goals of the, the future. And so one of the things uh, I, I was um, advising the European Commission in 2007 on a conference that we put together called Beyond GDP. And we thought this would engage the general public uh, and the media and uh, reporters, financial journalists, with unpacking the GDP and showing all the errors. And I can remember being there in Brussels and saying to all of my other fellow uh, commissioners who are you know, involved in this thing, um, well, you know, the general public is way ahead of the economists, the financiers, and the politicians. They understand perfectly why GDP, a money-based cash flow kind of uh, uh, indicator, can no longer measure the progress of a society. So they said, oh, well, uh, no, you're, you're wrong, Hazel. They, they really can't understand this. And so I said, okay, let's do a survey. And, the, oh, no, no, we can't afford to do a survey. I said, okay, my company will pay for the survey. So we joined up with GlobeScan, which is the, uh, the really the most reputable global survey company. And that we did a survey in, the, in 2007 in 12 countries, North, South, East, and West, very simply asking two questions. Which of these statements do you most agree with? The first statement was, of course, that a GDP, a cash um, monetary based indicator is the best way to look at the overall progress of a society. The second question was, uh, we should also look at all of the very available statistics based on science and the real world, um, which uh, look at uh, health statistics, education statistics, uh, statistics on environment, quality of life, and all of those things. And of course, what we found was enormous super majorities in every one of those countries, from Kenya to Brazil to Australia, every one of those countries, Russia, uh, they all agreed by 75% to up to 82% on the second statement. And then we, uh, we did that survey again in 29, uh, 2009 to see if the financial crisis had gotten everybody back into fear. Uh, no, the same result. And we did it again in 2013, still the same kind of result. And now that survey is in the field again, right now as we speak. And uh, very soon we will have the results once again. So this is just an example of how um, all of the elites, you know, the people who go to Davos and all of this kind of thing, don't understand that the public is way ahead of them. And now we have even the children in the street um, who are looking at the real world, which is why our Green Transition Scoreboard report, the last one we did, was called shifting basically from the magical thinking in the financial world, all based on abstractions, um, uh, to a science-based investing. And if we look at the real world and forget all of this abstraction, um, we can make some progress. Thank you, Hazel. Thank you. Let's try to keep to the shorter times. That was really important contribution. And I know that we're going to be tempted on everything, but we've got, we would like to cover a lot of different angles of this and we're just still at the beginning. So uh, uh, go to the second question. Uh, sure. Um, the next question is, what financial innovations are needed to finance the SDGs? Sorry, sorry could I jump? Uh, in discussion course, for a moment. Course, Dragan, if you want to address that one, go yes. ahead. Sorry for interrupting you, no, go ahead. but uh, I, I like to say something in support. Uh, Mariana uh, just mentioned, uh, actually we are living in an uh, in economic world uh, with uh, uh, deflationary pressure in combination with 
combinatorial innovations leading to, to some kind of disruptive innovations. This is a very bad combination in terms of uh, uh, money creation, uh, profitability, uh, investment and financing uh, other social issues because if uh, you have the problem with the income, uh, the funds are very, very limited. From the other side, we are living in the age of extremely high financialization. Uh, financial markets, uh, practically capital market, is decoupling from real economy. Uh, in the last uh, 50 days, from April 20 to uh, June 10, uh, S&P 500 has the historical maximum in a, a raise of uh, prices. Uh, in the same time, we have a problem with uh, uh, unemployment uh, and negative growth uh, rate. So something is out of tune in this system. Uh, I'm not providing uh, the concept of uh, uh, technological uh, determinism, uh, uh, Deus ex machina. But uh, I think that uh, we need combined uh, market forces with uh, visible hand of the state uh, through uh, so-called intentional policies, uh, policies uh, which are uh, targeted toward the SDGs set of objectives. Uh, let me uh, illustrate the previous point by, by simple example. Uh, one of the solutions for the medical crisis uh, we suffering much in the last period uh, is implementation of artificial intelligence uh, uh, with uh, uh, some uh, biomedical uh, methods uh, in uh, looking for the new vaccine. Uh, who, will, who will finance uh, these fundamental projects? AstraZeneca already prepared the uh, vaccine uh, and the uh, financing model depends strongly on the state involvement. So mm -hmm. intentional investments are very important uh, in the age when we have combination of deflation as a consequence of technological change and disruptive innovation as a consequence of combinatorial innovations. That le leads us to the concept of capitalism. Shareholder capitalism could not survive under these circumstances. We, we are looking for alternative wisdoms like entrepreneurial capitalism of uh, Mariana Mazzucato uh, or uh, progressive capitalism or Nobel Prize laureate uh, Joel Stiglitz or uh, most conservative uh, managed capitalism of former uh, vice chairman of IMF, uh, Professor Rajan from the Chicago uh, School of uh, Finance uh, and other concepts uh, based on quite different uh, fundamentals. One of them is uh, brief, brief. shaking the heads of the uh, invisible head of the market which is very important and visible hand of the state or uh, through intentional structural or industrial policies. Keep in mind, you have uh, policies for tradable sectors. This is one part of the problem. And also you have uh, industrial policies for supportive sectors. Infrastructure is very important, not only physical, but also uh, 
but also conceptual. Excuse me, Dragon, thanks so much for a wonderful contribution. Uh, you came in a little late after I had given the ground rules, so I, I want to repeat them, but we would forget them anyway. Uh, what we've asked is we have eight questions. We're going to ask different people to choose which ones they want to comment on, but try to limit the interventions to three minutes. I know in your case what your intervention is, and it's worth an hour or two we can listen. And I'm inviting everybody to the session on Thursday, uh, which is really on this subject, and your wonderful paper that you produced uh, for that session as well, uh, which will be published. Uh, but let's try to follow a line of questioning that will cover a broader area, rather each of these is a wonderful topic in itself. But we'd like to chart out, I should say, as I did in the opening yesterday, this is a process of discovery. And if we can chart out the issues that we need to address at this session, rather than think we're going to come to conclusions on any of them, I think we would have done something very important. And that gives us our plan of action for the next six months. Uh, we know we can't address all the answers here. Uh, so let's Let's go through the questions. Let's stimulate uh, different perspectives, as you are wonderfully doing already, uh, and not try to go too deep in any area. Flag it. We'll mark it. We'll note it. We're going to uh, go over these videos, and then we're going to figure out how do we address it. OK, Frank, what's the next question? OK, the, so the, the next question is, um, what financial innovations are needed to finance the SDGs and system change stimulate the COVID depressed economy and reverse climate change? I think uh, we would like to hear from others. And I know that both Hank and Stefan have something yeah. direct to contribute just before we go back uh, to a second round. So uh, why don't we start with Hank and then uh, Stefan? Uh, thank you, Gary. Um, uh, I'm a more practical guy, so uh, I always want to see what can be done and, and, and work on that. So what we are working now uh, is an innovation uh, in which um, uh, regions in Europe at, at this moment only uh, are implementing uh, regional payment systems uh, that allow that in which the money is contained for one year to force the money to behave uh, in a way uh, that you want. So there is a negative interest rate to stimulate circulation. Uh, the money cannot uh, flee the, the region. And as a, a result, the idea is that that will help uh, to, uh, to recover the regional economy. The second part of it is a little bit more complicated, so I just will point it out. That is um, that we developed a, a way to get a counter cyclical credit in which the credit comes bottom up. So a group of, uh, a group of businesses can join together uh, and accept, um, let's say, invoices uh, towards each other and make money out of it. Um, uh, the, the, the critical part there is that we make the supplier pay for the credit risk because uh, in banks it's uh, so that the, the person who wants to do something has to pay for the credit risk. We want to know if there is a supplier who has a marginal profit that is so interested in to get this additional client uh, that he wants to contribute to the credit risk. These two elements make money circulate moreover. The other element create money bottom up and uh, use the, the, mm -hmm. the supply chain to evaluate the opportunity of that credit. If there is no interest in the supply chain because it's fully booked, the credit won't, won't be created. If there, is, uh, if there is spare capacity, then the credit will be created and the supplier will contribute. These two elements, uh, I believe, uh, will be interesting in the coming period as a, as a tool of uh, system change. And I just like to mention, Stefan, just, to, I'm sorry, Hank has just come out with a new book. I strongly recommend it. Uh, and one of the things that this does, if I can just uh, 
add to it is, because uh, I was very impressed by uh, his work, uh, is he's trying to address the issue of money coming out of local communities in the real economy and being swept up by the global financial markets and going for non-productive purposes. His, his strategy really is intended to keep it in the local community where it's dealing with people and goods and services uh, at the local level. So it's directly related to some of our opening comments. Mm -hmm. Stefan, I know that you're, yeah. you don't want to open up a big topic when we have three minutes or four minutes, but open it and flag it. You're going to be presenting a paper on it. Uh, when is that, tomorrow? Uh, uh, actually, no, actually I'm only uh, uh, signed in for today, but uh, I will participate in the other, in the other sessions on finance uh, also just as a, as, a, um, as a participant, yeah? Um, uh, yeah, getting back to your question, three minutes, three minutes is tough, right? And refer to, your, uh, to the video that I did with you for more details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, three minutes is tough, okay. The figure, the UN SDG financing required roughly, if you look at the empirical figures, four to five trillion annually, right? Just as a figure. Mm -hmm. the, the reason why it's the variety of, some, some speak of 1.5, others speak of eight and 10, simply depends on the fact how, how largely the public infrastructure is reconsidered, like sewage systems, autobahns, etc. Then the figure goes up. If you stay with the SDGs, we're talking about four to five trillion. First statement. Second statement. The conventional way of financing developmental goals is basically by fees and tax, right? You produce something, whatever it is, a tank, a fossil coal mine, and then we tax the thing, and then we finance a kindergarten, right? And this way of financing is not very efficient. It's unproductive. And it's actually, if you look at the data, it's about by a factor five to 10 too low to finance SDGs, yeah. right? The financing through taxation and fees only can generate roughly between three and 500 billions, but not the four to five trillions, right? Third statement. If you look at the SDGs more in detail, you will see that about roughly a third of the goals are eligible for private money, right? So private investors. But two thirds are not. Two thirds are global comments. And we have to be very careful of making that distinction because at the, currently we have the debate that there is enough money on the capital market. Yes, but it's private money. Meaning if we start privatizing SDGs, if we start privatizing our seven SDGs, we're doing the same mistake we did in 1992 by following the Washington consensus. And we actually should not do that again. So the private over liquidity on one side is illegible with the right instruments of state guarantees and de-risk in instruments for the private sector, but the two thirds we have to finance in a completely different way, right? Mm -hmm. And WAS came up with the five-year process now uh, with an initiative called the Tau of Finance, where we can show how to finance these 17 goals, these two-thirds of global commons in a different way, right? Where regulators and central banks and financial officers and impact funds and hedge funds, they're all off. Nobody is, everybody has a skin in the game but we have to do it differently. And in order to show how that goes, I would really, Gary, need at least half an hour. Otherwise, I'm spoiling the entire, the entire uh, panel. But it is possible, last sentence, to start having that done in less than 18 months. We can provide the technology, yeah. especially blockchain technology and distributive ledger to make that happen in less than 18 months. It's not out of scope. But we gotta think differently. Thank you. Stefan, this is like asking us to tune into the next TV series. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really frustrating. I've read your work, Stefan. It's it's excellent. It's a really good idea.
We haven't heard from Lada yet. Would Would you like to comment and then Mariana, or should I go on? I, I want to make sure we get through the whole panel. Lada, why don't we hear from you on, on what we've discussed so far, and then we finish the first circle of participants. So my turn. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to take up on taxes. And because this is what I research and this is what I know a slight thing about. So, and this is, of course, the backbone reaction of any state when in need of funding, and especially those whose politics believe in public funding of services. But another reason for proposing tax is because it creates relations between people. It joins people. If we are all contribute in some capacity, to a common coffer that is shared among us. It makes people believe in a commonality, in a common society for a shared future. As the UN go Global Goal starts with, we the people. I thus propose a global tax, constructed so it concerns, if not all, so at least most of the citizens on our globe. Properly created and administered, that means collected, a global tax can finance many of the challenges we face the upcoming recession, the climate change, the SDG, but it can also bind us closer together. And Stefan, you might be right that this can only find us a small bit of it, but I think still an important bit. A common resp response across disciplines that research questions about tax and why we pay tax is reciprocity. We expect to get something for taxes paid, infrastructure, health, schooling for our children, etc. And this creates an explicit reciprocal relation and also an expectation, a relation that is created and maintained with our public bodies. But taxation also creates an implicit reciprocal relation, and this is often forgotten. We have to trust that all other who are paying tax contribute with their fair share, if you like and that they're willing to do so, but also that the tax collectors can meet the challenge of making everybody pay. But not any, any tax goes. We have to get such a tax right. And I want to point out a couple of issues I find important from a societal perspective. If and when we create a global tax that affects all, it has to be simple and transparent. It has to be constructed so that people understand what is taxed. It has to be so simple so it can be explained to school children, to literate people, to newcomers, to our societies. Taxation has become so increasingly complex in many places only understood by experienced and very well paid tax advisors. And this complexity is unfair and increase on inequalities. And the global tax I imagine has to concern if not all, so at least most citizens. The collection of course has to be transparent. And research has shown that the acceptance of tax depends less on its legal construction than on the way it is collected. So there are many digital solutions such as blockchain ledgers, etc., that can enable a transparent tax collection, making sure that funds are not disappearing into the wrong pockets or in the wrong bank accounts. Transparency also goes for how the revenue collected will be spent. We have to understand what it finances. In this, I don't know have a specific tax in mind. And this is a task of what I see as an interdisciplinary group of specialists. Many probably come to think of a Tobin tax. We've been speaking here about the real economy and the finance economy. But such a tax would only concern the financial market and thus exclude most of the globe's citizens. Climate taxes are interesting. Taxes that redirect our consumption from dirty energy to more sustainable choices. But such taxes are often fiscally very unpredictable because as their aim is to make the taxable object obsolete in the first place. So the tax I have in mind again is should concern all, even the poorest people. Yeah. So yeah, that's my sort of input into this fire of ideas. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Lada, for the great suggestions. Be before we go to the next question, I know Mariana, you had your hand up. Okay, just to remind you, the group though, we are one hour almost into our session and we've only been on one question. It would be yeah. nice, even if only one person's going to comment on each, that we get out the full range of the issues so we know the work we have to do. I'm sure everything's connected. 
Frank, let's just go to the next, uh, next question. What's okay. the, the next question is, how can we mitigate the powerful influence of the financial sector on political processes and policies? <laughs> just a small one, right? <laughs> could, could I jump in on this one? Although we haven't heard from Dragan yet. If you, yes, we uh, have. I would defer to make sure everybody gets heard on this first round. But otherwise, I would like to respond to that. Go ahead. Go ahead, Hazel. Dragan shared. Everybody wants. OK. OK. Uh, basically, today, uh, we all live in mediocracies. It doesn't matter what form of government we think we live under. We live in mediocracies and their attention economies. And the entire Silicon Valley, uh, all of the social media companies, they have algorithms to capture and keep our attention. And uh, so once we realize this, uh, we realize that what we have now is a, uh, a, a concentration between very large monopolistic corporations and the concentration on media. And they have bought up most of the world's media. So we have a huge concentration, about five large media companies, you know, Murdoch, uh, Time Warner, uh, Disney, uh, you know who they are. And so uh, basically, uh, if we open this up, and what's happening now in Washington is uh, there are many groups, both sides of the aisle, talking about breaking up media monopolies, particularly social media monopolies, you know, um, not only Facebook and Google, but also looking at the media, the monopoly now um, of, of Amazon. And basically all these companies rest on taxpayer supported asset, which is the internet. And so uh, the, the whole idea of breaking up Facebook, breaking up Amazon and all the rest of it is all in good currency now because we remember the breaking up of AT&T. I, I was a Washington policy wonk at that time and a big fight over it. But what happened was we created five baby bells and lots more innovation, thousands more new jobs, and so there's nothing wrong with breaking up uh, corporate monopolies and media monopolies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments to, to the question, how can we mitigate the powerful influence of the financial sector on political processes and policies? It's a big topic, Frank. Why don't we go on to another one? OK. Um, well, I, I could make one. a short statement. Yeah. You know, yes, I, I still think that if there was a chance, uh, I had the discussion with Mariana on that topic, how to mitigate. And I was thinking a two-tier approach would be helpful. If we were able to meet, for example, on an EU level, 25 people means the president, ECB, AU commission, plus 15 members of ministries, right? It's enough in one room and explain them the mechanism required, okay? And have a second tier meeting, let's say with the Bilderbergs or with WEF, where we have 50 people in the room, 5-0. These are the, uh, the managers who have 30 to 40 trillion assets under management. Not more than 50 people are there, right? And if you explain these mechanisms to these two groups, you can have a shift happening. I don't believe in bottom up. I personally don't believe in bottom up mobilizing and waiting until something is happening. I'm more a top down guy. I'm more a conservative nerd who likes to speak to those who make decisions in the first place and then change their mind. But this is a personal comment. That's a key part of the solution, co collaboration, working with leaders. I would just add one, one brief thing that um, allowing regulated ent entities uh, like uh, financial institutions to influence regulators makes it impossible for the regulators to hold them responsible. And then that's what creates the mechanism that compels them, not allows them, compels them to cause harm. So somehow we have to separate regulated entities from regulators. That's a key. Whatever system change with strategy could we come up with, we have to get the companies to ask to be held more responsible 
leveling the playing field for everyone, recognizing that that's what will make responsible investments the most profitable investments. Well, on that point, uh, the Task Force on Disclosure of Financial uh, Climate Risks, um, as you know, Mark Carney, who has, uh, is, uh, was the Bank of England, is now the climate czar for COP26, which is going to be sometime in the middle of next year. And the issue now, of course, is all about, as Frank says, disclosure. This gets back to media. And uh, when, you, when companies disclose their fin uh, financial risk and climate change, and that's one thing, but uh, the idea now is to make it mandatory with the SEC in the USA and the same with all the regulatory bodies in Europe. And I think that this would do more to shift uh, lazy asset managers that I've been in contact with for years. And you know, you say, look, can you look at your algo, open up your algo and see whether you're still overvaluing uh, financial uh, fossil fuel assets. And uh, they say, oh no, that's above my pay grade. Um, I'm not allowed to open up the algo. All I do is push the button and that's what I get my um, you know, my bonus from. And so I think what will happen is that if they don't shift very rapidly uh, to, to down revaluing these assets and shifting them to renewables, then about the middle of next year, there will be a bloodbath in the financial sector because uh, if they can't uh, change, um, then of course, a lot of people's 401ks um, are going to suffer. Excellent point, Hazel. Should we move on to the next question? Okay, the next question is, um, how can we promote system change in the financial sector? I know Keitan is working on, on something sure. in that. Yeah. Frank, happy to speak on that. Um, <laughs> Frank, I mean, one of the first things is when we say the financial sector, who do we mean? So, you know, when the money comes from, whether it's individuals or governments, where does it go? And a, a huge amount of it, something like 60% goes into the banks. So if you're looking to influence the financial system, you have to influence the banks. 35% of it nearly uh, goes into asset managers, uh, pension funds, and insurers. That's the second group you've got to influence. If you, if you get that 60 and you get the remaining 35, you've got 95% of, of the asset value that they can actually put to work. So those are the people you need to get together and see if you can have a discussion with them around how they see the world, the challenges, and whether they think they can change the policies and approaches they have to, to actually change the world and address the issues. Um, if, if they are making money in the current system as it stands, because the markets are beneficial to how they get measured and incentivized, then there's no reason for them necessarily to change. But I think what's clear though, is that there are cracks in the system now. There is an enormous amount of unhappiness with where money flows, how it flows, what it goes to. And the level of awareness of people, everyday ordinary people who put money in these banks, like all of us, um, you know, they are unhappy with this money and its application. The more awareness there is on that, the more likely they are to change. Clearly, people can vote to change, and it may be the financial institutions will do that. And as you know, Frank, you I and a few others are involved in a project to see if we can ask the financial community to come together and decide how they will get ahead of this change so that they're leading the change rather than the revolution comes to them. And look, in history, as, you know, as everyone on this call knows this, there's either a peaceful transition from one system to another, or it's very painful and often conflict-ridden and sometimes very bloody. And you don't want that to happen. We don't have to have that happen in the 21st century, given the lessons of the last century. So, the transition is likely to be something that ha can happen from inside, if the incentives are there. But I, I like very much what Stefan said earlier. There is an opportunity to parallel track or introduce mechanisms that allow change to happen in parallel and allow the movement to happen so people want to change. I think Stefan, it's worth you coming back to talk a little bit about that. I'd like a question to 
you, Ketan, or anyone in the group, it's a, it's a pretty simple question. I'm not sure the answer is simple, but we've got, we've been, we have a premise here that, uh, that so much of the money is going into short-term speculative investments, that it's not really going into the longer-term investments needed it's not available on long-term basis to create jobs and goods and services and develop the economy. Uh, what, what would happen if we simply introduced a, a graded capital gains tax that the shorter the term of the investment, the higher the tax rate to overcome this inherent urge for the speculative, to make the longer term investments, more stable investments, uh, more remunerative. So, so Gary, let me, let me respond to that quickly. Um, so my, my thought would be people change because either the outside pressure is so great they have to change. They change because the values have changed. They change because the incentives have changed. You've just outlined an incentive change. That incentive change could allow them to do that. In the absence of that, you know, inv investors have to make profits or get fired. And the people giving them the money tend to be the public who want this money invested for insurance, for pensions and so on. So the pension manager, the asset manager of that money must deliver the return required. And if that is a short term return, because it has to give a yield. So every month the paycheck goes out to an individual, that's how they're incentivized. So if you change the tax system, you change the reward system or the incentive system in some way. That will make a difference. I think the, the opportunity which Stefan and others have been researching and, and speak about is to, is to create a parallel system that allows people's incentives to be fundamentally different, for the source of capital to be different. And that's quite radical. And that's a great idea. And that's why I point to Stefan. But I think the idea you've given, Gary, is, is very right, too. We can use the existing system and change the incentives. But then it's a political question. Is the politician minded to do that because they control the tax system? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Keitan. Mariana? Yes, I would like to bring the um, aspect of um, small and medium enterprises into the game and by the way, and point out at the same time in, uh, to the Katniss article that um, uh, in the second volume that was just published that is called uh, Creating Jobs. Uh, um, using artificial intelligence. So search for it because I think we should not neglect the 55% of the GDP, that, that's the average number, that the small and medium enterprises are uh, creating. And they do bypass existing structures because they are not bound. Uh, they are bound by, of course, by legislation in terms of, you know, it's a for-profit or not-for-profit organization. But in the end, they are not bound like the financial institutions. You know, they don't go to, to jail if they do implement the UN SDGs within planetary boundaries or other aspects for that matter. And so I think this is a very important economic factor that uh, uh, allows the changing of the system bypassing. It's a, it is a bottom-up approach and it is actually functioning. And if you look at, and I have, and I must come back all the time to the exponentially growing technologies and the abundance they create, this is how Amazon was able, and not saying that's good or bad, that's a different conversation. But um, if you look at Uber or Airbnb and all these um, monopolies that are now out there, they bypass existing systems. They didn't look at the system. They didn't try to change the system. Maybe they did. But the result is that we now have a different kind of, of animal that we need to deal with. And this is the power that we actually have if we come in with a different mindset. If we, if we and this is my contribution to the UN SDG conversation, um, the intention is not to implement the UN SDGs. The intention is to implement the UN SDGs within planetary boundaries, and we only have 10 years to do that. So the conversation, uh, also I'm also a member in the Club of Rome, the conversation has also to include not only exponential technologies and the influence that it has, but also what we do with respect to climate change. And within that, uh, that context, I'd like to refer to the Transformation is Feasible report to the Club of Rome that basically helps us inform the strategies by which we implement and build companies in small and medium enterprises are uh, easier to do than changing the whole system um, so that we can set our, ourselves up 
55% of the GDP creators and job creators to really save ourselves and create the future of life. So these are, are important conversations. And within this other, um, uh, the same conversation, I'd like to also bring the, the, uh, to the forefront and emphasize the importance of, um, of uh, reinstating trust with cryptocurrencies. This is an extremely, people are losing trust. There's no reason why we should be co uh, continuing to buy the national, the government bonds because they are promising us bullshit and we have to call it such, it's not true. They're lying to us. So how can we uh, create a system and it's actually happening whether we like it or not. Cryptocurrencies where we reinstate trust in, in, in monetary systems. Uh, through blockchain and Stefan, you know, your entire Tao of finance is based on that. And uh, so I'm not saying that Bitcoin is the solution or other currencies. My problem with those is that um, they, they, uh, they're not uh, climate uh, friendly. So I hope that uh, some um, quantum computing will help us um, come up with a better model. But this could be a solution. And so, so much. In terms of Thank you, Mariana. Uh, among your many excellent points, I, I think the one about being within planetary boundaries is outstanding. Uh, we have a lot of theories and ideas in human systems, but nature doesn't care about those. We, if we don't live within the laws and limits of nature, you know, we, well, we don't have that option. We're going to do it one way or the other. So as Keitan said, let's do it voluntarily instead of involuntarily. Frank, uh, for Dragon, if I could. Uh, uh, Dragon, you were involved with an extraordinary, ex I'll call it an experiment, a successful experiment, 30 years ago in Yugoslavia, where you created a parallel currency. Do you think there's some insights from that experience that are relevant uh, in today's world? Please unmute, unmute your mic. This is okay. Uh, I fully agree with parallel approach. It's a, a feasible and very effective idea because uh, in the first uh, stage of transition, you have uh, uh, some sort of uh, a free fall uh, of the economic system. So you must find the, the new solutions uh, to make rebound as, as soon as possible. Uh, um, I, I like to add that I'm, I'm also involved in uh, the second most uh, successful uh, fiscal consolidation program during the governance uh, in which uh, Dusan Vujovic, our panelist in uh, uh, Thursday, uh, be participate as a finance minister. And the same idea uh, was on the table. So, uh, uh, but the, the question is the timing uh, because uh, you cannot uh, uh, continuously use uh, uh, two tracks uh, to find solutions. And you must uh, harmonize not only uh, monetary uh, measures, but also uh, tax, policy, tax policy measure uh, through so-called macroeconomic automatic uh, stabilizers. Uh, th uh, the first stage of so-called Avramovich program in, uh, it, it wasn't uh, Yugoslavia, it was the uh, Federation of Serbia and Montenegro. Uh, Yugoslavia was broke up in 1991, but it was the, 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 the one part of the former state. Uh, uh, the, the main problem uh, in harmonization of policies is uh, to change from uh, the former uh, track to the new track. Uh, this is the question of timing. Uh, Avramovich program uh, lost momentum uh, and uh, the main problem uh, was the inefficiency in funds, keeping in mind uh, small countries uh, uh, doesn't have opportunity to, uh, to make quantitative easing, printing money and other uh, uh, unconventional policy measures. Uh, 
we uh, we solved this problem by privatization of state-owned uh, companies, let's say family silver of Serbia's economy. We uh, sold uh, telecom Serbia and put the whole sum of money in this process. In a, a fiscal program 2014-2018, which was definitely most successful one. Uh, Minister Vujovic uh, get a prize uh, as the Minister of the Year under the uh, uh, IMF and uh, World Bank uh, uh, prize. Uh, we uh, put the money through SDGs. Uh, SDGs uh, financing the capital deficits and uh, offer to government to make the fiscal, fiscal balance. Uh, it's an interesting phenomena that in the first quarter uh, of 2020, uh, echo effect of this policy was very positive. And the uh, uh, Serbian economy uh, uh, has the 5% growth rate in the first quarter of 2020. But uh, it, it, it is not easy to continue on this policy because uh, some problems coming on the place, but uh, uh, fiscal consolidation and using two-track approach is the magic formula uh, to make the changes on efficient and sustainable way. Okay, Thank you. let's go to the next question then. I the Okay, so the next question is, how can we alter the behavior of businesses that face high competitive pressure and short-term financial expectations? Can I jump in on this one? Please. There's two, two points, really. Uh, first of all, all of the accountants that I work with uh, are, are much more uh, open than economists and textbook kind of uh, models. And the, the model that they use now to measure corporate performance, as you all know, is that there are six forms of capital, of which finance capital is only one. There's intellectual capital, social capital, um, human capital, and of course, natural capital. And the way to judge the performance of a company is whether they enhance or degrade all six forms of capital. And so that's a tool which is becoming more and more widespread now. And uh, once the credit agencies who have a, a lot of responsibility for the mess we're in, if they begin to also pick up the six capital model. And then the other tool that is very important now is uh, QE. Uh, most of the central banks uh, now that I know of that are beginning to compete now in terms of their own digital um, currencies to cut out the private banking system. Uh, basically, uh, they are beginning to realize, as the Bank of England is, that uh, with the stroke of a pen, they can do quantitative easing, which we all call green QE. And instead of quantitative easy, where you just throw it against the wall and hope that it'll work out well, where it all turns into asset bubbles, um, you direct quantitative easing to where you want the money to go. And we see this now with the Green New Deal in the US, all of the stimulus money now um, is going to be directed toward the future economy we need to build, with renewable resources. And you see uh, the president of the EC, Ursula von der Leyen, saying exactly the same thing, that if the 750 billion euros of stimulus um, coming up in the European uh, Central Bank or whatever, not one euro of it is going to go to bail out the past and to bail out the fossil fuel economy. It's all going to be directed toward building the infrastructure and all of the new assets that we need uh, in the Green Deal. Mm -hmm. And this is happening in 130 countries. There's a study at uh, Stanford that 130 countries now are quite able to shift 
uh, toward the uh, greening of their own economies if they simply stop fossil fuel subsidies and subsidizing advertising. It's just as crazy to continue subsidizing advertising as it is to subsidize fossil fuels as we still do globally to the tune of five trillion according annually, according to the IMF. So let's look at those, t those tools as well. Those are great points, Hazel. I, I, I would add something that you have written and spoken, sp spoken about extensively, and that is money creation. Instead of using uh, private sector money to fund these activities, let's take over the creation of money, then we can fund right. them without raising the national debt and taxes. So ending yeah. fractional reserve lending. Exactly. I think point has something he'd like to add on this. Stephen? This is this is actually in line with our our approach. You know, if you look very closely to the so-called European PEP program, pandemic emergency purchasing power program, right? Fund the line is disgusting. There's three ways to generate that money. Once you go to the private capital market and loan it by, from private investors, you have to pay it back. The second is you make simply a, a, a a tax transfer system from one generation to the next or from one country to the other. And the third one is you create a green QE program to generate the same amount of money doing the same amount of stuff. And if you take that argument one step further, just one step, you're exactly in the midst, in the midst of our argument of the WAS initiative tower of finance. If you do that with blockchain associated distributive ledger, allowing social contracting, addressing SDGs directly, right? And refunding into the entire economy. You're right there with our argument. And then you have created a dual system, which by the way, Gary, allows the traditional investors to swap over from a negative yield where they lose money by the billions every day because they have a negative interest rate at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the Swiss state bond is yielding negative one, 2% on a 30 year scale, right? So you don't invest even in Switzerland anymore because you don't get any money out of it. So if you take, tell these investors at the moment you have to be losing money, but we provide you a green marketplace with a slight positive interest rate. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to swap their trillions. So this is called an X swap strategy. This is exactly what we're proposing, okay? A shift from the conventional brown economy to the green economy. And this requires a dual system. And that's why we called it the Tao of Finance. Are you discussing creating new forms of money, Stefan? New types uh, of... Uh, uh, Hazel is referring to a, to a debate called CBDCs, Central Bank Digital Currencies. About 12 to 15 central banks are unofficially experimentally working on that topic already. I'm in, I'm in contact with some of them. Technically, it's actually very easy to generate that dual track. It's very easy to do that. We just have to understand the mechanism, how it's running to allow the public sector and the private sector being part of it. It's, it, those are excellent ideas, and I, 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 I need to promote them. I'm glad that WAS is. But one, another key point of that is who's creating the fiat currency, the U.S. dollar, for example. Right now, mostly banks are creating with fractional reserve lending. Just the government can create it for free. We don't have to pay interest on it. That is a, and then that is something that could be done very quickly. Make Fed, the Fed part of the U.S. Treasury and require banks to have 100% uh, reserves, as Milton Friedman required, it would be a huge benefit. But, but also, the, the, the work you're talking about is excellent, too. There's no one single solution. And they are talking about that seriously. That's what you're saying, Stefan, that a lot of the banks are serious. Oh, yeah. The question is whether we get that money that's reinforcing existing trends or really being invested in the green area, which will solve our problems. And yes, the, the point is, Gary, the point is, Gary, we have now data available, empirical data, that the investment in global commons, the return on investment in global commons is roughly about factor 10, 50, 100 times higher than private yields. 
So it cannot be a private business on its own. It has to be blended finance. And central banks who normally are a public institution, are normally not a private institution, should primarily have global commons in their focus. So if we generate that money basically out of nothing, use distributive ledger technology and invest it directly targeted into these sleeping exactly. giants basically who are un unleashed we can have huge amount of wealth creation right for mm -hmm. everybody and this can be done in less than 18 months yeah. it's, yes. it's likely that banks would buy into that more quickly because they can profit from it whereas if we take away their ability to create money through fractional reserve lending, they could lose up to $500 billion per year of revenue. So they're probably not gonna buy into that strategy that, that quickly. Yeah. Your approach is, is, would be more receptive. But we just have to bypass the private banks. I mean, you know, it was just a ridiculous idea in the first place because uh, the money can be generated by public, uh, by the treasuries directly. And so this, this is the debate. There's a group in London that's doing wonderful work on this called Positive Money. And they have a group now in, the, uh, in Brussels for the EU. And they sat down with Christiane Lagarde and uh, brought the whole idea of the green QE to her. And uh, we have a video up where she is looking at it and saying, yes, she would be willing to consider this. So everything has been opened up really uh, by the pandemic, uh, that suddenly it's accelerated all kinds of uh, debates that have been stuck for 40 years. And mm -hmm. so uh, that's one of the good things about this terrible, terrible uh, pandemic. Thank you, Hazel. I, could, oh, again. Thank, could, I, could I say something uh, about financing of uh, Green Deal? Uh, we, we must make clear demarcation line between green credits and green bonds. Uh, this is two source of financing from liability side and from asset side. Yeah. Uh, uh, green credits needs conditions, Hazel just explained. Uh, if the central bank uh, made the, the QE, uh, the trench of money coming to the industries, uh, which uh, are uh, in some sense carbon free. But green bonds are, are something, something different. Uh, uh -huh. My suggestion is uh, not parallel approach, but multi-track approach, because uh, some privilege of uh, uh, one sort of financing could be balanced with uh, tax uh, measures and combine uh, sources of financing with tax measure uh, in order to define the new, uh, let's say, uh, carbon-free, uh, climate-friendly uh, uh, new economy. Main problem is how to restructure uh, current uh, industries and current businesses, because it's not easy to, uh, to uh, make transformation in General Motors or Volkswagen uh, toward the electrical vehicle. Uh, GM expect at least 10 years for this project. Volkswagen has a problem. Majority of uh, uh, QE, they are allocated in all industries right now. Uh, so investment in startups is not fair enough to make the uh, job creation on the fair level and on sustainable level. But this is very good idea, and we must uh, to support this. Thank you, Greg. Uh, on the job creation issue, 
we have to remember that uh, around the world, more people are employed in cooperative enterprises than all of the for-profit corporations in the world put together. This is UN statistics from uh, 2012, which was the year of the cooperative. So looking at different corporate forms, I mean, I invest in cooperatives. You get a better return than you do with a negative interest rate from your bank. And so the other, of course, is the B Corporation. Um, we, our company is a B Corporation, uh, where you say specifically that we're not about um, returning money only to shareholders, but uh, the charter says that it's for the public interest and all the stakeholders. So we have all of these tools together and uh, I think we can move, uh, I agree with Stefan, we can move tremendously quickly on all of this if we really want to. Thank you, Hazel. We, we've been discussing um, money and I have a question here that I think would be appropriate for Hank, who's impl already implementing many uh, uh, effective monetar monetary policies. And the question is, what are the dynamics behind the concentration of money? Yeah, that is, um, of course, a very crucial point. And uh, the, the problem is there are various and they can, if one doesn't work, money swaps to the other. So you have, for example, uh, the ownership of land. Land normally was a public thing, but now the ownership brings a lot of money from some people, from a lot of people to a few people. Mm -hmm. uh, you have, uh, yesterday we discussed the, uh, the, the liability, uh, we have to transfer by profits, uh, as long as there's a profit, it goes from, uh, from the majority to a small group. Uh, you have, um, for example, the, what we discussed just before, uh, the thing of the creation of money by private banks and the income that delivers them. Uh, so all these uh, things, tax evasion, uh, and of course, what is interesting also with the pandemic now is the uh, the ownership of know-how. So the patent rights, um, uh, all these things should be moved basically together because if you don't move one thing, uh, the money will be concentrated to make more money out of the other thing. And um, yeah. Clearly, if we accumulate wealth in this, uh, the, the way that's done now, uh, everything we have said will fall down because uh, there will be so much money looking for investment to, 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 get, to get the money out of it, that it will always be difficult to withstand that as a society and to keep the social structures ready. So. I would say let's go for all the things, the speculation, the hack from the interest of rent, uh, the patents, the creation of money, uh, and uh, the liability that is absent uh, when the profits are uh, well, falling down in externally for, the, for society. So we really need to address these. Mm -hmm. Great ideas. Any suggestions about how to bring them about? Uh, yeah, there, of course, um, I yeah, yeah, th this is a very difficult question be and it is per uh, element, it's different. Uh, I think that the uh, interest on real estates, uh, on land, um, that is a thing that should go from communities that regain uh, their rights on, on earth. On the other hand, it can go top down. Uh, from the level of uh, we have a limited earth. So uh, to, to take from that limitation uh, should be taxed as well. Um, I'm presently working uh, on, a, uh, on a plan for the new government of uh, Suriname. And um, Suriname is a country with a lot of imports. And imports always uh, are uh, physical. It's uh, raw materials, it's energy, etc. And they pay it with raw materials, gold, uh, you know how it is mined, uh, the oils uh, that have been found recently. So uh, you, in the import prices, we should have import taxes that include 
all the the pressure on on uh, on energy uh, on the nature uh, natural resources so it's um okay land should be done uh, locally but also in through the uh, uh, through the import taxes uh, patents yeah of course this is this has been a crazy situation for a long time already so uh, maybe Stefan can talk to some people and and they decide uh, to skip this uh, <laughs> all the way uh, what is important that the normal people the public gets aware that this patent thing uh, is against them that they pay for the universities that they pay uh, for all the thing and that others are going are, are yielding uh, getting the yield of it so uh, there is of course some some elements that we but we have to raise consciousness and uh, as in all things you need bottom-up pressure and then you can get results at the top uh, taxation will be uh, in a lot of elements important now we discussed the uh, creation of uh, of money don't underestimate the power of the of the banks it's very important for them to keep the situation running as it is on yeah. the other hand uh, in the present situations where the market interest go into negative um, that is a, a difficult situation for them to maintain this profitable thing and that's also why we created a bottom-up money creation because you only need 10 percent and then you uh, the the interest levels on the market can go up because if you have an opportunity uh, to lend for for uh, without interest then you will do it and there's historical evidence uh, for example uh, when the romans uh, occupied uh, egypt they met with uh, the grain gyro system which had a negative interest rate because people who brought the grain had to pay for um for the storage cost and and to the father of course uh, and then the the romans came with banks that were based on gold and that asked at least three percent uh, interest so no entrepreneur uh, would go there and uh, and borrow the money there they would always borrow it uh, in the uh, in the local uh, grain euro banks so we we don't need so much competition there to to move that element uh, also but of course i hope that uh, that uh, uh, people at the top um, see especially with the elements of the green deal see an opportunity in the in the green uh, green um, in a Q8, the green Q8, it would be it would be marvelous. But I think we need to go on both sides to try to pressure that and to work at the other side as well. Mm -hmm. There's many complex solutions needed. You and others on the panel are already working on them. Thank you for the great ideas. I think one way, to, uh, a meta way to to uh, address some of these issues is to, to, and to help it make it clear to average citizens is to look at the overarching problem, which is the failure to hold companies responsible. We have something that people in the future will have a hard time understanding, and that is we hold individuals responsible, but we allow companies to cause massive environmental and social harm. And it's this allowing that compels the harm. So in general, how do we apply the, the rule of law and hold them fully responsible? through you know, full cost accounting. We, take, we, we integrate all uh, or account for all positive and negative impacts. And then we, hold them we either hold them responsible for the negative impacts or we simply don't allow financial and economic transactions that harm the environment and society. That's what, so that'll be obvious to people in the future. The fact that we're not doing it now is you know, people will look back on what we're doing now the way we look back on slavery and witch burning. We're living in a crazy time, but it's hard to see when, when you're in the middle of it. So. Thank you. Another question. Next question. Okay, so the next question is, um, how can we increase- Sorry, may I, may I interrupt for a moment? Shouldn't we go to the public now? Because we have been talking a, a lot uh, with our own ideas. Can Good. we- what I was going to say, thank you. Uh, anyone wants to ask a question to the panel, please do it not in the chat, but in the Q&A uh, function. That yes. will 
chat is for discussion and I meant to uh, announce it earlier. There's it would be great to have questions from the audience. So you go ahead with the next one and we'll, we'll be monitoring for questions. Well, those are coming in. The next question is, um, how can we increase funding for early stage companies that are focused on benefiting society and resolving environmental and social challenges? <coughs> Hank, then Mariana. Maria? Yes. Okay. Uh, basically, that's what we are doing. And we have, uh, uh, we create networks of businesses and uh, with a special uh, type of credit, we allow uh, uh, st startups uh, to get credit, but also to get uh, consumers, to get access to consumers or access to uh, to businesses that want to buy with them because there's always in every company there are two elements you need uh, the money and you need the clients uh, so that is basically what we are doing uh, nowadays but uh, Marianne uh, can you unmute yes I think uh, the issue that we have right now and I, I keep coming back to it is that there is actually too much capital we are printing too much of it and um, without addressing the issue of, uh, um, of its uh, losing uh, the value. So the question now remains, how do we make sure that the capital that is actually being made available right now, particularly right now, um, actually doesn't trickle down as uh, it did, not reaching those that uh, should be reached as it happened after the financial crisis, how we can we prevent that? and um, the reason why I wrote this article um, that I mentioned before in Cadmus is um, the, the, the answer to that question is better de-risking. So how can we um, make sure that the banks who are basically responsible for making the capital available that has been printed and, uh, by the government and, and made available by the government reach the uh, entrepreneurs on the ground who are right now actually in more need than before because they have lost assets. Um, they usually uh, don't have assets. Uh, if they had any, they lost. And uh, so how can we increase the trust into the companies? And that's the better de-risking. And um, the integral model that I developed over the past 30 years provides exactly that. And the good thing is that you can increase the de-risking by adding sustainability criteria to your de-risking criteria, to the screening process. So um, the strategy that is behind the integral investing is based on the implementation of the UN SDGs within planetary boundaries. So you go through the screening process um, when you de-risk the investment. In addition to that, um, we are using, and I'm referring to that in the article that is a, uh, uh, makes a large part of it, is uh, the using of uh, wisdom of crowds of experts, an AI-based system that applies the wisdom of crowds in order to accelerate the screening process. So this will ensure that the money trickles down in a better way and reaches the, um, the small and medium enterprises that are basically the job creators, not only job creators, because the big companies, the large companies are currently transforming Please think again about the exponential tech impact that that has, you know, whether it's automotive or telecommunications or anything, even, you know, education. So they are transforming. And those who are more flexible in changing the economy, uh, the, economy the businesses, and that was your first question, uh, <clears throat> uh, is uh, the small and medium enterprise. They can be creative. They are creative. And so bringing money to those actually has a huge impact from as far as I'm concerned on uh, creating jobs right now and uh, providing uh, a transition period. Uh, mm -hmm. And while we use the print, the uh, qualitative easy, we need to work on transforming the system so that we don't end up where we are right now in, you know, just five or 10 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, just building on what Mariana just said, um, also the, uh, the issue of why the money doesn't trickle down, all of this enormous stimulus, trillions and trillions of stimulus, is because it's going through the traditional banking system. Mm 
And well, we just need to go back to Milton Friedman, um, who back in the 60s said that the most efficient way was what he called helicopter money. You take the cash, you go up in a helicopter, push it out the window, and everybody gets to pick up the cash. And, you know, this is basically uh, what Stefan and I agree about, um, is that you create the money directly and you don't go through the banking system. We, we have the power to do it directly. And this is what the, some of the central banks are now deciding to do, that every citizen will have a, an account directly uh, with the central bank. And we don't need private banks to be in the way. And the one of the reasons, is, one of the reasons why that is, is because they are um, lobbying. So oh, when the yeah. governments are basically deciding, uh, you know, um, you know what money it's needed, how to um, oh, yeah. re uh, start the economy, and so on, the banks, you know, are the powers that be. They are influenced, and so they get it. And because they benefit, they used to benefit. Right now, they don't really. So we but, have to get um, money out so, of politics. Exactly. So <laughs> I, 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 and I, I am, I am in these conversations, you know, through the Club of Rome at the uh, in Brussels, and I said, well, why don't you bring people on the ground who are actually taking the money and turning it into real economy? Right. That but they don't. To make a point, but but let me just say quickly. In addition, Hazel, bringing um, money to the uh, entrepreneurial companies, I think your work with the Green Scorecard helps a lot, a lot in that area by raising awareness. So just simply letting people know what's going on is an important Thank way to move money there. Thank Stephen. you, Paul. Uh, okay, we'll have a couple yes. of questions here. Uh, can I add one element? Community, because uh, I think what we also need to understand is that we need to reinforce the community sense in societies. I remember when a partner of us starts in Sardinia, everybody asked, what's in it for me? And a few years ago, uh, there was a fire and the, the business was not well uh, insured. And then all those businesses that first said, oh, what's in it for me, now understood that the network is important for them. And they paid mm -hmm. voluntarily, they donated the money. Uh, so that's what Community Sense can do. And yeah, it's proven there. They, they, of course, the businesses know they earn uh, 20, 30,000 additionally because of the network, but they now they care for the network. They start to learn that economy is something you do with others. Mm -hmm. Which is another positive upside of the of the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. Now we're going away from the global shipping of everything and going to the local communities and empowering them to produce yeah. locally. Yeah. Stefan, yeah. one sentence. One intermediary step would be that part of the commercial private um, banking system is turning into a non-profit banking system, a communal banking system, because once it becomes communal, we can keep up with the reserve, fractional resource system itself, but it serves the community by definition. You know, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, the Public Banking Institute in the U.S. is promoting uh, publicly owned banks at the state level and the municipal level and never sending the money to Wall Street, keeping it at home. And uh, the tax base of each one of these states, as about 14 states now, are looking at legislation to keep the money at home. And this way you fund your own businesses and you fund your own community banks but the banks are public utilities which is what they should be just like the electric utility and hazel that radical idea is simply going back to what banking was in the 19th century right <laughs> not 19th century even up until the late 80s in the u.s uh the banks were all state level banks and That's most right. were yes. community level banks and the money stayed there Yes. And you couldn't have a bank in the U.S. that operate that collected funds in more than one state. There That's were right. chartered banks. The yes. biggest banks in the world were in New York and California, but they only took money from New York and California. They had no, uh, the, they couldn't collect deposits outside of them because they were meant for the local community. We yes. have a question uh, for Hank, I think would be appropriate is how, 
how do we, we talk about creating money or doing things on the SDGs, but how do you get the community involved? And it seems to me your approach is a bottom up community based approach. Uh, mm -hmm creates money for what community wants and needs. Can you say something more about it? Um, the starting point is, of course, that we have uh, a very weak community sense between businesses uh, in practice and in the heart, it's far better. We know that because if we, um, uh, if we say, okay, uh, what, by, by local, uh, you give your partners that you might know more opportunities. So that's the starting point, uh, let's say buy local. And then the next point is, okay, but if you buy local, maybe your money will go out of the, of the community. So make it, do it in a way that, that the other one is compelled to do the same. And that's when we created the uh, the time-based money that we can say okay if you start buying local you know that it will be for a year for example uh, in the in your own uh, community and it will contribute to the community and then we get uh, always the difficult point is that a company thinks yes but if i can only spend it local uh, i spend it will be more expensive uh, the quality whatever but then at some point we, we play a game with them and they learn, okay, I will lose maybe 20% uh, of my money because of inefficiency by spending local. But it, I earn twice or three times. So what is the 20% against the two or 300%? You know, so it's, people have to experience it. That is, there is no way around in the beginning, they all think, oh, if I have to spend local, if I have, to, to spend uh, also sustainable, th that cost me a lot of money. And only when they learn, but it gives me opportunities as well, then they start to accept it. But that, take, that takes some time, to be honest. O often two or three years, uh, it takes at least uh, before that's happening. The sense of community is not what it used to be, John. I just got a question on the mindset, and I think uh, I'd like to say something to this. I think um, this is the key, basically, um, to the transformation that we all want to uh, to, uh, to to generate here. And um, from <clears throat> my perspective, just to say how mind shift or mind change influences um, the, the early stage and the community investing, which is basically what small and medium enterprises are doing. They are local. Uh, very rarely they go international and they get big and so on. Most of them are local. And uh, as an investor and a serial entrepreneur, the most important aspect, 80% uh, of the risk uh, in investing in, in, in building real economy through a startup company, it is made through the team, through the individuals. And so that's one of the important aspects of the de-risking process. Um, and there, are, there is scientific research that is basically is not being used in early stage investing or venture capital, but it should be. Um, a closer look at the people. There are amazing tools from Stanford, Harvard, and MIT. I'm a computer scientist, uh, but I got a PhD in psychology because of this. I needed to learn about this, is um, you know, to use these wonderful tools. And so once we work with, uh, with the people who already get it, then the transformation occurs because the tipping point comes at 10%. Uh, that's how much, uh, how many, uh, you know, what the percentage of the society that needs to get it in order to shift to a new um, economy, mm -hmm. to new everything. And so this is where, from my perspective, where the hope comes in. So thank you very much for the question. Sure, thank you. And Keitan, that's a point you started out with. Yeah, I, I've got to admit that as I, as I listened to a very interesting discussion, um, that the venture capital industry and the private equity industry combined is, is about 2%, less than 2%, I think it's about 1% of the capital flows of the world. So, you know, there's such a shift required back to how does the individual, the consumer affect capitalism itself in the financial system? And when you look at it that way, you start to realize that if you, if you say who is a participant, two thirds of people on the planet either have a bank account and don't use it or don't have a bank account 
or don't have a mobile phone where they could use digital finance through their mobile phone. So our discussion has been focused on the one third that are participants, but there are two thirds we've not managed to get into the financial system itself. So our challenge is huge. And despite the coronavirus and the increasing synchronization of challenges we're having, it's not clear that we've reached the inflection point where we will consciously want to change, get together and say we will change. And we see that from the undermining of financial institutions, um, sorry, international institutions all around the world, or the UN, the WHO and other institutions. We don't seem to be able to put our arms around the fact that we're facing the, the cliff of the edge, you know, the edge of the cliff rather. And so it may be that we have more to come, more suffering. And Gary, you're in a perfect place to understand from where you physically are today, that sometimes suffering turns into something very positive. And maybe we've had enough of it, and maybe we haven't, there's more to come. Well, it's, I'd like to take that uh, as a cue because this has been a remarkably positive discussion in remarkably challenging times. And I think the participants should know, the attendees should know, this, this was not a structured, planned uh, outcome that each of you in your own way has seen an opportunity here. And I think it was a, a, a very remarkable in the sense that the this is not a one solution for everybody. There are multiple ways in which we can change the system. It embodies virtually everything from entrepreneurship to uh, creating new forms of money, uh, uh, to addressing the patent law and community currencies and everything else. And I think this is the most realistic discussion that I've heard on, not that we have come up with a final plan or that was never the intention, but I wanna thank you all for, uh, for the out of the box thinking positively and realizing uh, to pick up what Katan said, that, uh, that this unique situation we're in is creating a unique opportunity. And our question is, how do we, how do we convert the challenge into an opportunity uh, uh, to really generate the momentum we need for substantial change. Uh, and I want to just flag that for the rest of the week, we have some very interesting <laughs> discussions going on. Uh, uh, Dragon's going to be uh, moderating a session on new growth model and economic policy platform on Thursday. Uh, Katan is going to be running a program with uh, uh, some hedge fund managers on Friday morning, Friday, the role of finance in addressing global challenges. Uh, uh, Stefan's going to be telling us more about his, the Dow of finance. When is that? That's on uh, Thursday also, business and finance session, I think, right? I, I'm officially not part of the group any, uh, anymore, but I'm participating if I get a link. You'll get a link. You'll get two okay. links if you want. Okay. <laughs> so this is. And Gary, we will have more than hedge funds. We'll have development finance, uh, private equity, bankers, wealth oh, yeah. managers. So we'll have a very solid group. Oh, wonderful. This is not the end of our discussion. This is the beginning of our discussion, not only this week, but this week is only the beginning of it. And uh, we want to build on all the ideas that we've heard here and see how they fit together. And what can we do in the next six months to come to the Geneva Conference with a more comprehensive and coherent picture of how these complementary opportunities come together. So on that, I would really like to thank you for wonderful, original and complementary perspectives uh, looking at what can be done rather than what the problems are, which is exactly the intention and the focus we wanted to have in this meeting. And I know uh, I also want to thank you for your patience and restraint because we could have had any one of you talking for the two hours and not exhausting what you had to share with us. But we found a, a combination of getting enough glimpse of what those opportunities are, and we will be back together working together to put it uh, 
to see how it all fits. So thank you very much to the whole panel and to our attendees. And for any uh, uh, apologies to anybody whose questions we did not get to, uh, please send them to uh, the academy, the admin. We will pass them on to the right person. Uh, we will consider them. We will try to get back to you with answers wherever we have not done it during this discussion. And we don't here. We have, it's early, it's getting late in India, but it's early in the day in North America and still daytime in, uh, in Europe. So there's much more programming to come uh, in the next few hours. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.